Welcome to our Oxnez Online family. I am so excited and humbled that you have chosen to take time out of your evening this evening to spend time with us. Tonight, we're going to take a closer look at the creation versus evolution debate. And we're going to really zoom in on why this tool is going to be so important when it comes to determining how you're going to spend your eternity. Yes. So I am joined right here by one of Canada's foremost creation scientists, personal friend and mentor, Ian Juby. Ian, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, I'm just so excited, you know, sometimes <laughs> I get really excited. I'm just happy he's here. He came here from all the way from Eastern Ontario. Ian, tell us a bit about yourself and say hi to the nice folks. Okay. Hi to the nice folks. Uh, uh, I'm, yeah, as you mentioned from Eastern Ontario, Tyler and I go back a long way. Um, but I had nothing to do with that kidnapped mall Santa that he had in his trunk. Uh, I have an alibi. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Tyler comes from, uh, yeah, actually Tyler and his wife even came from up our way. Uh, but yeah, I've been uh, involved in uh, the creation evolution topic now for, oh, 30 years, 30, 30 some years. Uh, traveled around the globe speaking on it, researching on it, uh, been uh, on, the, on international television uh, for 20 some years on it. Um, I've been producing and hosting Genesis Week, which is, uh, has aired internationally, uh, which is a, a creation evolution TV show. Uh, that's been running 10 years now. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I still, I still remember, because I, I fired it up first on YouTube, is where I kicked it off. I remember. And uh, I was at my buddy uh, Derek's place in Alberta, and uh, I asked him if, uh, hey, hey uh, you mind if I set up a green screen in your basement while I'm here? And we did that. And so I filmed a couple of, uh, uh, we call them evergreens. Okay. It's, it's, no, it's a, a timeless show that you can leave on the shelf and pull off for broadcast and just air it whenever because it doesn't have any time frame. You know? Right. Whereas Genesis Week was a current events show. So yes. it's, it's got a timeline. So I, I filmed two or three evergreens there. Yeah, yeah. And that was for Miracle Channel because they had, as part of their process of uh, putting shows on, on the station, um, they, they have a, a board which reviews the shows and everything. And, and they loved it. Okay. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they were ecstatic. So I mean, it was the first, the first several seasons were just filmed green screen with virtual virtual studio um and it was funny too because i had people come up to me you know it's like uh hey, you, do, you, do you go down to toronto and film those or what are you <laughs> but no actually i had uh, about thursday i go into my bedroom and i move the dirty laundry to the side <laughs> and uh lay my green fabric out on the floor <laughs> and set up the lights and i have to push the bed back because the camera has to go there and uh you know, and so this is an internationally broadcast television show, you know, <laughs> top so, notch stuff. Yep. Yep. It was, it was, it was top notch stuff. So, uh, yeah. And I'm, uh, the director currently of core Ottawa citizens for origins, research and education, Yes. Uh, which was formed, I think in 1984. Okay. It's an, it's an old time, old time, old school creation science group, uh, out of Ottawa. Yep. And, um, they took, myself and Genesis Week under their wing. Um, and uh, so they, they solicit donations to finance the production and the airing of that show, which is still airing internationally. It airs right across Canada on the Miracle Channel. And uh, it's currently being carried in um, Michigan as well. Okay. Um, it was all across the US and then I, I <coughs> dropped that years ago because of the Anyway, long story. I won't get into that. But we appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta. We gotta get moving. So I'll. I'll. I will leave it at that. So. All right. And he's done a bunch of other stuff too, which you saw yes. uh, during the countdown at the bottom. He's done a lot. Hmm. So much so that we don't have time to cover it all. Really, we don't. So 
here's what you can expect this evening. <laughs> this evening, I have five questions that I've predetermined that I'm going to use to grill my guest over here. <laughs> and then once those five are complete, we would love to take your questions. Uh, hopefully my questions kind of spur you on or remind you of things that you always, oh yeah, I remember wondering about that. <laughs> and maybe they'll even link into another question that you thought. So as we're going, if you questions pop into your head, write them down. I know I always forget by the time these shows come to the point where I can ask. So I usually write them down, but you know, text them to yourself, whatever you need to do. But we do welcome those questions and we want them. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is ready. He is prepared. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I'll try my best. A little burnt after today. Yes. Yeah. I think, Both of us. Uh, I think people can see that. Yes. A little red. Yes. Yes. We spent, but it was, a, it was still a good day. It was a good day. A good we day. spent the day out at Joggins Fossil Cliffs, mm -hmm. just so you know. It's exciting. I got pictures mm -hmm. and video. It's pretty cool. Yep. I might put it up later. <laughs> but for now, Ian, let's jump right into it. Okay. My first question. Why should we care? Okay. Why should we care? Why is it important? Yep. that today's Christian educate themselves on, or at least be aware of, creation versus evolution, the origins of life. Why do the origins of life matter to today's Christian? Because, short answer is, it's because it mattered to Christ. Interesting. Um, now, of course, Jesus didn't just raise people from the dead. He also rose from the dead himself. So obviously he knows more about this than we do. Right. <laughs> and uh, evolution, it, it's, it thrives on survival of the fittest. Yes. Natural selection, uh, disease, literally, uh, death, the weeding out of the weak. Uh, that's what evolution promises you, whereas Christ promised you life. Yes. So huge difference. And most people aren't aware of this, that um, at the time of Christ, uh, be, sorry, before the time of Christ, 550 years before the time of Christ. Okay. Uh, Charles Darwin was very much a late player to the game. Okay. Uh, Anamaxander, Anamaxander of Miletus, he was a Greek. Yep. He had a theory of evolution that he had contrived of all of life evolving basically from the fishes. Okay. And this was 550 BC. So whenever Christ referred to uh, the origin of mankind or uh, the origin of life or uh, the marriage even, okay, um, okay. It, it didn't matter what they asked Christ about, he always answered in reference to the writings of Moses. If you do not believe the writings of Moses, how will you believe me? Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. So um, he could have, and this is a really significant point, theory of evolution was already around at that point. Yeah. Uh, he could have, if we had evolved, or if he had, uh, as the creator, if he had used evolution to, uh, to create all of life on Earth, yes. for example, um, as many people believe he did. Yeah. Uh, there's many people out there who believe that God used evolution to uh, create mankind, uh, the human race, uh, for example. Um, but if he had, why would he say the creation account according to Moses was history, was true history? Right. He could have pointed to Anaximander yeah. of Miletus. Oh, just take a look at the Greeks. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they've, they're on the right track, right. is what he could have done. So just as significant of what he, what he said is what he did not say because it was there yeah. it was available yeah um and christ is the one that promised us the way that he was the way the truth and the life so if his is the way to life and evolution unapologetically says it is the way to death yes literally yes uh, that is the the backbone of evolution um well take your pick which one do you do you want yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but Christ said, no man comes to the Father except through him. That's right. So, so that's why it's important. Okay. And I often tell the youth <clears throat> whenever this sort of thing comes up, well, 
you know, maybe each day of creation was X amount of years, a million or a billion or whatever. Right. And I'd say, well, Adam was created in day six. He lived through day seven and then carried on. So the dude would have been like two billion years old. Yep. yep. I'm afraid that Ooh, doesn't work. You're on the <laughs> ball. Ooh. So that's that's where we end up at youth group. But I like this too. This was new for me, guys. I didn't know about this guy in Greek. Mm-hmm. Okay, very cool. So that's my first question. We're off to a bang. Okay. I'm liking good, this. Good, good. Question two. Mm. Reading through the genealogies, yes. we can oh. determine a little a little bit loosely that mm. the creation is about six thousand years old. Young Earth, okay? Not millions and billions. But when we hold the Bible up against something like carbon dating, Mm -hmm. carbon dating gives us ages of 50,000 years old. So how how can a Christian account for that? How do we say, well, no, it was 6,000? Yeah, that's that's not just a really good question. It's a common question. In fact, uh, Roberto brought that up today yes we were at a joggins um and asked about carbon 14 and um so i've i've got this this conventional geologic column here uh shown and of course they've got you know up to 540 million years old for uh the age of the fossil record basically yeah uh there's rocks that they would claim were older than that um and most people get these ages mixed up with carbon 14. Carbon 14 dating cannot arrive at ages that that right. high. Um, and the evolutionists won't even try to use carbon 14 on say fossils right. because they're just too old. Um, so the way the way this works, we've got nitrogen in the upper atmosphere through a series of uh, steps or events uh, basically you've got cosmic radiation coming in from the sun ultraviolet light uh, you know, things like that and uh, interacting with the molecules in the upper atmosphere they turn nitrogen into carbon 14. so it's carbon but it's a radioactive form yep. and because it's carbon it's chemically identical to you know the carbon that we're made of you yep. know the carbon in your pencil everything uh, so it interacts chemically exactly the same as any other carbon. Uh, so, for instance, it'll bind with oxygen and form carbon dioxide, which plants eat. Yep. Plants eat carbon dioxide. Uh, the animals eat the plants. We eat the plants and the animals. So everything takes in this radioactive form of carbon yes. and, and consumes it when the plant or animal dies obviously they stop taking in carbon 14 Uh, they stop taking in all forms of carbon and so you have this ratio because us or plants have used carbon to build our bodies Uh, you have a ratio of the normal carbon and the radioactive carbon in your body okay the radioactive carbon breaks down radioactively over time so uh i've got a nice pretty chart here so if you were to look at it when you first start you've got a really high carbon 14 content which drops to zero over time and uh, it actually drops quite quickly now you you had mentioned that carbon 14 you know returns ages of like fifty thousand years yes that's actually pretty rare okay uh generally speaking it's only a few thousand years what most people don't understand is after a hundred thousand years absolute maximum all the radioactive carbon 14 has radioactively decayed back into nitrogen it is no longer carbon 14. so after a hundred thousand years your sample will have zero carbon 14. is that called the half-life uh no the half-life is how quickly it gets there oh okay yeah uh so the half-life would be um uh how long it takes for half of that to break down okay uh and of course it's exponential um so where was i so carbon turns to nitrogen after yes. hundred thousand years carbon cannot go yes it's past there's, that there's zero left okay the sensitivity of our equipment our most modern equipment can only read to about a maximum of sixty thousand years old because by that point the sample 
the amount of carbon-14 is so small um, that it has a really hard time even measuring it. Okay. Okay, so here's the catch. When you do take carbon-14 samples of things like fossils, I've got a triceratops, this is a fossil triceratops horn, and this is actual fossil, and uh, what creationists have done, because the evolutionists haven't, um, we have taken samples of fossils, for example, uh, and there's, okay, so this one here, this is uh, in the Creation Science Association of Quebec. That is a, a hadrosaur dinosaur bone. That was one of the fossils that was sampled by uh, Vance Nelson and Brian Thomas. And so basically they took samples of many, many, many fossils uh, and all of the samples returned ages of between 5,000 and 50,000 years old. Okay. Not just for theirs, uh, but there's a, another gentleman by the name of Hugh Miller, who sadly passed away last year. Um, and Hugh and his team had taken um, samples of uh, uh, fossil trees, co coalified trees from the dinosaur beds, uh, dinosaur bone samples, coal samples, uh, Creation Research Society has published multiple publications, CO2 wells, uh, crude oil, natural gas wells. They all return carbon-14 ages of between 5,000 and 50,000 years old. Yet those are all supposed to be millions, yeah. usually tens of millions of years old. Coal is way down there Yep, on that time yep. list. And in fact, uh, Vance and I, when we were out here in 2008, we got some coal samples out uh, from here in Nova Scotia, specifically for dating, we gave them to Hugh. I don't know if he took and used those samples or not, um, but he did have several coal samples uh, tested, as well as Creation Research Society uh, had a, a huge study where they did that. Um, and took uh, coal samples from the U.S. Geological Survey and dated those. They also uh, carbon dated diamonds, which again are supposed to be up to billions, billions yes. of years old. Uh, they all return carbon-14 ages of between 5,000 and 50,000 years old. Now, does that mean they're 5,000 to 50,000 years old? No. It just means they have so much carbon-14 still left in them that we can measure it easily yeah it is well within the bounds of our equipment yeah well within the sensitivity range so that tells you they are not what's the oldest we can get i'm, I'm gonna grill you now hundred thousand you said but 100, 000. sixty thousand on the gear it's, you know, just, oh, you demand okay <laughs> I'm, I'm paying attention you guys <laughs> so we we can say definitively not one of those samples are older than 60,000 years old. That's right. So we can say that definitively. Because the gear would be able to get it. Yeah, so let's, let's, say, let's say they are 60,000 years old. Okay, that means I'm out on my age estimate for this fossil, because I say it's only 6,000 years old. Yeah. Because according to my Bible, the earth and everything in it is only 6,000 6, years. 6,000. Most. So let's say the carbon-14 age is correct. Okay, I'm out by a factor of 10. The evolutionary paradigm, which would say this is at least 60 million. Uh oh. What's that factor? That's a factor of a thousand? <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. That's high. It's high. That's high. So, so wow. I'm, I'm willing to accept that if they are. So, if that is 600 million years old, it should not have carbon in it, and yet it does. Yep. And yet coal and diamonds, yep. we're talking, should not have carbon, and they do. And they do. They have lots. Lots of carbon, well and within the gears range to Oh, yes. Up. Now, some, uh, I brought this up on Genesis Week multiple times. Some skeptics have jumped up and down and said, oh, it's a fossil that's been all replaced with rock. No, actually, it hasn't. So what this is, this is a screen capture from uh, a Creation Research Society uh, video and what you are looking at is dinosaur meat what? So this was not the first nor is it the last that has been found 
So um, the reason they went looking in fossil dinosaur bones was because Mary Schweitzer and her team, uh, I think it was 2008, I think I've even got a picture here. Uh, they had a dinosaur bone from Montana, which they broke. Was this the T-Rex bone? Yes. Yes, I remember this one. And um, so this is, this is a picture of what they found. Uh, they, the, they had a bone that was too big to fit in a helicopter. That's how they removed the, the dinosaur fossils from the Badlands was by helicopter. I sure wish I had their budget. <laughs> um, but it was too big for the helicopter. So they broke the bone in half. Now, while nobody likes to do that, of course, um, the reality is the bones are already broken. Um, so I still remember it, the, the Colorado dig. Um, there, and most people don't realize this about dinosaur bone beds. There are so many bones, so many dinosaur bones. Uh, we had one there, and I still remember Joe Taylor eyeing it up. And I had worked for a couple of days helping to excavate this one clump of bones. And we dig around it trying to find the edges okay. of the bones, right? Yeah. And we couldn't. There was no edges. Everywhere we dug, there was another bone. More bones. So uh, at, at the point where we just where Joe made the call and said, no, okay, we're just going to break the bones where they are. Yeah. So we plaster jacketed it around. That was probably a three or 400 pound uh, lump of rock with dinosaur bones. And so we rolled it out of there and just let the bones break where they will. Uh, Cause we're going to, we're going to glue them back together in the lab anyway. Sure. So anyway, we're Schweitzer Swite, and her team. They broke this bone apart. When they got back to the lab, there was this stuff sort of dangling out of the middle of the, the bone and one of the uh, lab assistants was uh, taking it. They soaked it in a weak acid to get rid of the minerals. Yeah. And they were left with dinosaur meat. It was Tyrannosaurus rex meat. And um, th there's tons of videos on YouTube. I can't show them because it's copyright stuff. Uh, but you can look it up uh, where they took this dinosaur meat, T-Rex meat, and under a microscope and they stretched it, stretched it and you let it go and it stretches back into its original shape. Incredible. And that's exactly what they did on the CRS video as well. Yeah. So I didn't show the, the motion there, but that's exactly what they were doing there as well. That's a completely other different dinosaur. And they stretched it and right on video, you can watch it, stretch it, let it go and it stretches back into its original shape. So the whole half of the point of that video, the Creation Research Society video, was because several years ago, they took a Triceratops horn from Montana, the Hell, Hell Creek Formation, um, the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum in Glendive, Montana. They have dinosaur beds that they hold excavations in all the time. Yep. So they're looking at these, these creation researchers, and they're like, I wonder how common this is. So they go out into the Badlands of Montana, they find a Triceratops horn, scored, excavated, brought it out. First fossil they find, Mark Armitage, and I had him on my, on Genesis Week, I had him on the show, and he even showed video on, shared video on the show with us. Um, he reached into the inside here, and he was pulling off sheets of bone cells out of the inside of the Triceratops horn. And they were still flexible. You could, he was stretching them on, under the microscope Incredible. and letting them go and they were stretching back. So the skeptics are trying to say there's no more biomaterial yeah. to carbon-14 date because if it's just rock, well, it doesn't have carbon-14 in it. Well, actually it does. And that's where it's all from. Yeah. You know, uh, there's this material called bioappetite or bone appetite um, that's in there as well. Uh, that's, it's a, it's a biological material part of the, the building blocks of bones and stuff like that. It was hilarious. I was at a conference in New York with, with Joe Taylor, my buddy. He's a paleontologist, right? Texas, homeboy, right? He's up there and he's giving his lecture and he starts talking about bone appetite. Okay. And the audience started chuckling a little and he's like, yeah. what? And they're like, it's bon appetit. <laughs> oh, that's not the way we say it in Texas. <laughs> anyway, it was hilarious. Um, so bone appetite is one of the things that still uh, in the bones, yes, that can still be dated. So that's why I got this Triceratops horn 
specifically, so you can see I've cut sections out of it. Um, I'm sampling it um, to look for originally preserved biomatter in the Triceratops horn is the hope. And of interest, this one I haven't scored on yet, um, but uh, Dr. Raymond Demadian, the inventor of magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. MRI. He is a young earth creationist. And he actually suggested that MRI could be used to detect originally preserved biomatter in fossils. Okay. So I got a fossil dinosaur bone. It was a, uh, I believe it was a hadrosaur bone. I'm trying to remember now. Had that one MRI scanned. I had this MRI scanned as well at the same time. We didn't find anything. So I've, okay. I've struck out so far. Okay. Um, but now the second phase of that research is cut some out. Uh, d soak it in weak acid. I've got a couple of tricks up my sleeve. Um, this is part of the research, part of some of the research I'm conducting at the moment. Um, I won't say what my secret chemicals are. Uh, we won't ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, the, the point is just demineralize it. And now to verify, because as part of the MRI, MRI research, it's just as important to verify that, okay, the MRI showed nothing. I need to verify that there isn't anything in there. If right. this is completely solid rock, everything's been replaced, then we need to verify that, you yeah. know, just for testing the MRI hypothesis. Of course, right? yeah. So anyway, so that was, how did we wind up on that topic? Carbon dating. So oh, yeah, it's carbon dating, yes. The T-Rex bone yes. that had the flesh in it still. Yep. T-Rexes are the same age as Triceratops, 600 uh, million? In that case, yes, because they are the same formation. So if evolution is to be true, mm -hmm. flesh can last 600 million years. Close, 60 million. They 60 actually million. say 75 million. 75 yeah. million years. Yes. So when I'm, whenever, I'm, whenever I'm giving a talk with the kids, I always encourage them con to conduct scientific research. Good yes. science. Yes. Go to the store, buy a steak, bury it in the backyard. Yeah. Come back a year later, dig it up, use the five senses. So, you know, science. Yeah. So, what's the five senses? You gotta touch it. Touch it. You gotta smell it. Smell it. You gotta see it. Look at it. You gotta listen to it. Listen to it. And you gotta give it a lick. Taste it. Yeah. So, it, <laughs> explore it, analyze it, study it, take notes. Bury it again, yeah. come back a year later, dig it up again, do it all over again, yeah. bury it again, come back a year, dig it up again, do that for 70 million years and see if you have anything left. Okay. Uh, it's absurd to suggest. Now, not only that, and I discussed this in the Complete Creation, which everybody can catch online for free now Absolutely. on uh, youtube.com slash wazulu or go to wazulu.com or go to genesisweek.com. Um, one of those episodes, we, I, I showed historic documents of when they were building the Erie Canal in northern U.S. Yes. It's the same limestone formation as Niagara Falls. Okay. So it, it stretches into Ontario and whatnot. Repeatedly, it was happening so often, nobody was questioning whether it was happening or not. Okay. The scientists of the day were asking, how could it happen? So this is supposed to be 450 million year old rock. Yep. And they were, uh, as they were removing the rock to build the canal, to dig the canal, they would break the rock open and there was these cavities with toads in them. Toads. And the toads were hibernating. They were in, still alive. Still alive in solid rock and in front of multiple eyewitnesses many, many, many times. These toads would fall out, they would reanimate, they would basically wake up uh, apparently it was the cold that was keeping them in hibernation okay uh, what they call the state of stupor um, they would uh, reanimate in front of multiple eyewitnesses usually they died within the hour but they would start hopping around this wasn't some corporate hallucination in one case they reported it alive for several days afterwards um, so this was happening so often that the scientists of the day were asking, how could this happen? They, they believed it was rock from Noah's flood. So they're still looking at this going, how on earth is these toads 
surviving for 4,500 years. I mean, yeah. that's what they believed, right? Right. And they thought that was impossible. Yeah. So that led to all these cruel and unusual experiments where they were, you know, burying toads and oh. keeping them in logs and stuff oh, to see what, oh, no. see what killed them and what kept them alive, you know? Okay. Uh, so anyway, the bottom line is, once again, now, now we're not even talking about a fossil. That's we're right. talking about a living organism. And it wasn't just toads. They were finding clams as well, still alive in uh, hard clay marls under the uh, limestone or sometimes in the limestone. And they were still alive. The guys, the guys uh, collected a bunch of them, cooked them up and ate them for supper. It's like, you know, so this was, this is the kind of stuff we're looking at, right? So and how old is that limestone again? Allegedly 450 million years old. With live toads? Yes. Evolution, okay, okay. Yes. Even creation. Yes. 4,000 years. Yes, even from a young earth creationist perspective, it's mind boggling. So. Wow. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, that's exciting. I got another question for you, though. Okay. So that's carbon dating. According to creation, in this book you've got right here, the Bible. Mm. According to that, dinosaurs and humans lived together. They would have had to. There's clear proof Why do you that say they that? exist. Well, let's, let's, let's examine the evidence for a moment. We've got proof over here that they existed. We've got yeah. a bone here. They yeah. existed. Yeah. The Bible says all the land animals were created, and then the persons the day after. Actually, on the same day. The same day. Day that's, six. That's right. Day six was all of it mm -hmm. for Adam. Not Eve, though. Eve was after. Keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Keep okay. that in mind. Most people just gloss right over that. They weren't both on the same day. Adam was already in the garden and getting lonely <laughs> by the time Eve was created. But side note. The, so the proof is here, and we got Big Al. Okay. Right? He's looking pretty monstrous. He was walking around at the same time. Okay. But the Bible does not mention dinosaurs. What is up with that? That's, what is the deal, Ian? Okay. What is the deal, Ian? That's an excellent question. And that came up last night. It did. At so youth group. Does, yep. Came up last night, youth group. Oxnaz youth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what is, what is, uh, does this chair make me look fat? No. Makes me feel fat. No. Looking at the monitor. Well, anyway. you're relaxing after Sorry. a hard day of That's joggings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was a long day of joggings. Um, so... Uh, it is an excellent question. Where are dinosaurs in the Bible? Yeah. Um, I think they are in there. Okay. Job chapter 40 and 41 talks about a strange, cre uh, a couple of strange creatures, Leviathan and Behemoth. Yes. And when you read the descriptions, uh, tail like a cedar tree, for example, mm -hmm. it rules out everything like, you know, the hippopotamus or the elephant. Take a look at them. They do not have tails like cedar trees. I was going to say, the notes in my King James say this is probably referring to a hippo. And, and many, uh, unfortunately, many Bible versions actually replace the names Leviathan and Behemoth with hippopotamus and crocodile. Oh, dear. Which does not stack up to the description nor the original words. Tail like a cedar tree. Correct. So there's that, but... Um, the catch is the, the word dinosaur was not invented or coined until uh, it was, I think it was the 1870s. And it was a guy by the name of Richard Owen who interestingly was a creationist. And he founded the British Museum of Natural History. Whoa. Um, and he is Fancy. the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> the one who actually coined the name dinosaur. Okay. And uh, before he came, coined that name, dinosaurs were simply called dragons. Hmm. And so dragons are mentioned all throughout the Bible. In fact, yeah, that's right, there you go. Uh, in fact, you can even go uh, to the British Museum of Natural History. And of course, part of the process of excavating dinosaurs is um, plaster jacketing them. Yeah. So uh, when, uh, if you go to the British Museum of Natural History, you can see uh, excavated dinosaurs still in their plaster jackets from the 1800s okay with dragon written on the plaster Fascinating. because that's what they called them then because the word dinosaur hadn't existed mm -hmm. and as you go throughout history as well 
you see the historical legends, records, myths of dragons. Uh, and it was, you know, in the medieval time, it was, uh, it was the thing for uh, uh, a knight to go out and yes. slay a slay dragon. Slay the dragon. And um, so you've got, and also you see uh, artistic documentation of dragons. And um, it's funny, your daughter brought this book out. Vance Nelson. Yes. Canadian, fellow Canadian creationist Vance Nelson. There he is. Dire Dragons, fantastic book. All he did was he took um, historic artwork. Yep. And showed. Architecture even. Yes, an architecture depicting dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> And they called them dragons, and he compares them throughout the book. It's a gorgeous coffee table book, um, and he's got, I forget how many examples in there, but I mean... There's a lot. It's not a small book. And uh, all he did was he compared all of these artistic depictions with our modern understanding of what we know or what we believe these dinosaurs look like. And it's it's a stunning match yeah. in uh, over and over and over and over again. So even in historic times, there's reasons to conclude uh, that dinosaurs and humans still lived together. And so that's after the flood. Uh, last night with the with the youth group, uh, I was showing some of the casts of fossil human footprints with dinosaur tracks. And um, in that in those cases. Sometimes the human stepped on top of the dinosaur track. Sometimes they stepped beside it. Sometimes the dinosaur stepped on top of the human footprint. Yes. But it's all limestone. And limestone is where we get concrete from. Right. Uh, to get concrete, they take limestone, they bake it, drive the water out of it. It turns into a powder. It dissolves into a powder. They sell you the powder. Yep. You add water, reverse the chemistry, and you make pourable limestone. Um, and you can, put, so how, how fast is concrete set up? You know, if a person walks through the concrete, makes footprints, how much longer do you have for a dinosaur, for example, to come along and walk and make footprints in the same layer as the human? That day. Has to be. Yeah. A few hours at most. Yeah. And so all of these footprints um, found together uh, demonstrate that humans and dinosaurs live together. And it's funny because uh, uh, some skeptics will say, you know, well, that, that rock was uh, like the Delt track, for instance. Um, they say, well, that rock's a loose slab rock. We, we need to know the provenance of the rock where it came from, the history, okay. that yeah. documentation. And I agree, that's best, but it was a loose slab rock. Uh, the Paloxy River just literally rips up entire sheets of rock uh, the size of cars, the flash floods, it's just okay, it's unreal. Wow. I, I have never <laughs> seen flash floods like the Paluxy anywhere else on planet Earth. It is unreal to watch. Wow. Um, but uh, so Alvis Delt found that slab in the riverbed with yep. these footprints in it. Um, <clears throat> so the catch is it could be a carving, but that's why my friend Dr. Carl Baugh came up with the idea of using CAT scans, three-dimensional x-rays. Okay. Because we can look at the structure of the rock, the slab. And because when the human or dinosaur steps in the rock, they compress that mud. Right. And so that shows up as higher density rock in yep. what is now rock. And so we can look at it and we can see the density variations conforming to the footprints. Which so you would we not can, have if it was a carbon. If, if it, it was, was a carbon. carbon. Because you're removing rock, not compressing. Not compressing. And um, so the provenance, because we can verify that both the human track and the dinosaur track are genuine tracks, the provenance suddenly doesn't matter. That rock could come from Mars That's right. and we don't care. That's right. Because we it demonstrates <laughs> humans and dinosaurs live together at the same time. Yeah, we do care. But, uh, Mars would um, be cool. <laughs> it, it would be, yeah. Dinosaurs and humans on Mars at the same time would be even more radical. That would but, be interesting. But, uh, <laughs> And that would be an expensive rock to bring back from Mars. Mm. That, that thing weighs a lot. It's expensive to bring in my van. So, anyway. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, I, so we, dinosaurs in the Bible. Yes. The word hadn't been created yet. Yes. And they're in there. 
Yep. They're described in there. Yep. They've just been classified incorrectly sometimes. Yes. And we've got fossils to prove that they've stepped in the same mud on the same day. And fossils of humans and dinosaurs found together. And fossils of humans and dinosaurs <laughs> found in the same layer of rock. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Ashley phosphate beds, which again, written about in the 1800s before evolution really took hold. Yeah. Um, and once again, these scientists are going, you know, they're, they're digging through the Ashley phosphate beds and they find, you know, this human, clearly human leg bone. And the scientist was like, well, obviously it's an intrusion because, you know, it, what, we find hadrosaur bo bones in this layer. So an he throws it away. An intrusion? Yes. Yeah, he, he figured it was an Indian bone. And it somehow wound up in, you know, falling through a, a hole in the dirt or a crevasse or something and wound up in the layer. It was contamination, basically. Wow. And so he wrote later on how much he regretted that because they, because that wasn't the only human bone that was found in that layer. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of them um, that were found and human artifacts as well. So um, how do we shift the age of the dinosaur? Do we shift the age of man or do we ignore? Yes. Because <laughs> if the dinosaur yeah. is 60 million right. and man is only, according to evolution, what, a well, few hundred thousand? Uh, let's see. I think 100,000 years would be the okay. most for so, modern man. So if they're found in the same layer that's supposedly 60 million years old, but now we've got man in there and artifacts, do we make they the would, dinosaurs younger or do we make man they, older? They wouldn't even... Actually, I, no, uh, they, would, they would make it all younger. And I go by uh, Louis Jacobs, okay. who was the uh, president of the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology. So oh, wow. the Society for Dinosaur Diggers. Yeah. And he wrote in print that if dinosaurs and humans lived together, it would dispel an earth of vast antiquity. In other words, the earth would be young. Yes. And he said uh, his words were uh, all of Earth's history could fit into the creation myth, the timeline of the Bible. Oops. So he said that. And then we found um, it. Yes. So, well, he, he denies all, the, all this, of course. Um, but his point remains the same. And we would agree on this. Uh, in fact, multiple evolutionary scholars have all said the same thing. If you find dinosaurs and humans together, that demonstrates the Earth is young. It demonstrates the creation account is true. And evolution is vanquished. Their words, not mine. Wow. I just agree with them. Yeah. And then we found it. <laughs> Yes. Incredible. Yeah. And but the thing not. is, they were, they were found like over a century ago. Okay. You know, it's like over and over again. So okay. anyway. Wow. There you have it. Dinosaurs in the Bible. What's our time at? Our time? We've been going, we've been going on a long time, man. We have been. So I'm sorry. I can combine the next two questions a little bit if you like. Sure. And then we're going to hop to your questions. Okay. Um, you've been doing a lot of significant research here in mm -hmm. Nova Scotia mm -hmm. and on the East Coast. We're talking blue, what'd you call it? Blue, blue beach. beach. Blue Beach. Yes, yep. with the ostriches. Yep. And we're talking planation. Yes. And just as significant as fi finding dinosaurs and humans together. Yeah. So birds are supposed, supposed to have evolved from the dinosaurs. Yes. Which according to the evolutionary timeline, they went extinct uh, around 60 million years ago, give yep. or take a week. Um, <laughs> Just a week. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a little margin of error. Yeah, so, so obviously birds would not have arisen um, much later. Well, they wouldn't have arisen later than that, say 58 million years, okay? The, they would have arisen from the dinosaurs is what they would claim. Because um, we're supposed to have dinosaurs with proto feathers. Correct. Yes. Yes. That is also the claim. That's a fun topic, actually. Um, I bet it which, is. <laughs> uh, which I'm, I'm okay with a dinosaur with feathers. It's just that I have a lot of questions. But okay. Anyway, uh, so in Blue Beach, there's a photograph of a right there, very famous fossil trail, uh, which I do recommend people go and visit. Nova it's, Scotia. Uh, right over there. It's that way. Uh, it's about, I don't know, 40 kilometers that way, 50 kilometers Bay that Fundy. Way. Yeah, it's the Bay Fundy. Yeah. Um, just around the corner from Joggins on the other shore. And um, so this very famous trail of tracks 
was found in the 1970s. Wow, and they are that. very, very unusual tracks. Okay. I first heard about these when I went, we, we did a, a trip to Joggins, Nova Scotia, because I had gone to Joggins a couple of times by that point. I had started my research. This was probably 2004, oh, I'm wow. guessing. Okay. Um, we, uh, the, the Creation Science Association of Quebec, Lawrence Dizdle, and the gang, we put a group of people, I think we had 15 people, and we came out, and we were here for, I think, four days, uh, just looking at Joggins Fossil Cliffs and whatnot. And um, I've forgotten his name right now. I'm so sad because he was a super nice guy, uh, but he was running the Joggins Fossil Center at that time. Okay. And because it was a primarily French group, the only thing he had in French was this leaflet, which mentioned this trail. Okay. And it mentioned Horton Bluff, which I didn't have a clue where that was at the time. Um, and so in 2008, I believe, is when I first saw this trail. Vance Nelson and I were here uh, researching Joggins, and we went over to Blue Beach. Vance found a fantastic trail of uh, basically amphibian tracks. Okay. Um, beautiful trail and exactly matched the tracks you would see in Grand Canyon. Okay. Um, so that rock is alleged to be 350 million years old. So older than Joggins. 350 million, million year old years old rock. Old. Yes. So uh, when I first saw the trail, I'm like, well, hold up. That's a right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left pattern. This was a bipedal animal. So what they had said in the leaflet. Two two yeah, feet. two feet, two feet, <laughs> two footed. Uh, what they said in the paper was that it was a lizard-like creature okay. that made the footprints. So I, I looked at this and I go, hold on a minute here. Uh, that was my first surprise was th this is not a quadruped, a four foot, four, four foot. Mm. Four quad. Um, <laughs> uh, this was a bipedal animal and I didn't have a clue what it was. This is actually a cast I made of one of those footprints. As you can see, it's a very unusual C-shaped track, oh, and what's yes. hard to make out, there's actually a claw impression off the tip of one of the toes. Okay. And they were consistently like that, in a right-left, right pattern. The inside toe had a large claw, which didn't always make an impression, but typically did. And as you can see, I mean, look at the size of this track. It's huge. It's, it is a big track. And I was looking at this, and it was probably a year or two after before I figured out what it was. And I took a wild stab because I'm going through in my head, both in the fossil record and modern animals. What do we have that, that is bipedal, that only walks on two legs, yeah, two yeah. feet. And um, I narrowed it down pretty quick. And the one I think it was, oh, and by the way, so this was, this is straight off the Museum of Nova Scotia, natural, the Natural History Virtual Museum. Okay. So this is their depiction of the lizard-like creature, creature they call Baropesia. This is their depiction of it making that trail footprints. Okay. They just subtly agreed with me. Notice they have it being buoyed up and only walking on two legs. Two legs. Instead of four. Yeah. <laughs> so they inadvertently and subtly, agree, uh, subtly agreed with my interpretation. This was a two leg, this was a creature walking on two legs and a right, left, right, left pattern, yep. right? And the tracks do not, this is Baropesia. Take a look at those footprints and compare them to this one. Okay, not the same at all. Not, not even remotely close, no. not even close. And Baropesia is the lizard creature. Yes. So <laughs> it gets a little wild because uh, I think it was 2008, a professor from New Mexico um, wrote about the Blue Beach Trail. And he claimed this was actually the impressions of the flipper from a fish. Wow, okay. So he, he, said, he rejected the Baropesia interpretation. No, 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 no. This was, this was fin flipper markings from yeah. a fish, okay. you know, uh, I, I reject that notion as well. I think it's ridiculous, especially because you can identify this creature. 
Uh, do, do you think you can identify a creature by its footprint? I do it all the time hunting. What? Yeah. You Straight do not. Up. I do. It's important to know what tracks your prey leaves. Bingo. Okay. Even amateur track uh, trackers Uber can, trackers. I, can identify a creature by its footprint and can off, if they're even somewhat skilled, they can even tell you what the creature was doing, its behavior, when it was making the footprints. So you can definitely positively identify a creature by its footprint. And I believe I have identified that creature. <laughs> and so to, to verify or refute this. Nice picture. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I went to, uh, I think I have a picture of his feet. I do. This there was taken are. at the Del Alta Ostrich Ranch in Alberta. Uh, Cornelius and Diane uh, were the ones who were on it. He was actually a pastor. Um, so I was just looking for an ostrich ranch, and I found this, these, these folks out in Alberta and uh, called them up, and it was, they were very helpful. They, they uh, let me walk their ostriches through uh, mud. We poured a bunch of water on the ground, and yep. it was not easy, actually. It was a, okay. lot, it was okay. a lot of hard work. Um, but as you can see, ostriches have very unusual feet. They've got two big toes, a prominent claw off the inside toe, exactly like the Blue Beach tracks, and exactly like the Blue Beach footprints. And what I discovered when I had the ostriches walking through deep mud, deep soft mud, they tended to hunker down with their outside toe. Okay. And it completed the C shape. And in fact, the heel, which you can see on the back of the, the left yeah. foot there, that would even dip in and leave a bit of a dimple impression on the back, which even the Museum in Nova Scotia acknowledged that little dimple on the back of some of the tracks. Okay. So uh, we're, we're agreeing with each other on this one. Yeah. Um, and so there is one of the photographs there. I've got it outlined because it was so hard to see. Right. But as you can see, it is a dead ringer match. Now here's the catch. Ostrich is a bird. That's right. Birds were not supposed to have evolved before at least 60 million years ago. Why are their footprints appearing in rocks allegedly 350 million years old? Footprints of a bird. Yes. Well before so, dinosaurs. Yes. Well before, well, no, this wouldn't be before the amphibians. This would be about the time of the amphibians, uh, okay. according to evolution. But um, this is just as destructive to the evolution model as finding humans and dinosaurs together. Okay. Here's the catch. Only, uh, I think, one or two kilometers from this spot in the 1800s, Famed geologist William Dawson from here in Nova Scotia found this fossil, and you can see the uh, the you know amphibian or lizard footprints. They're quite prominent. Yep. You see the B and C up there. B and C, I do, and I don't know if you can see that on camera. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but right up here, there I what looks to me like some sort of seagull, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Waiting bird. <laughs> some sort of bird. Okay, at the same time. So it's, it's, I, this, was, this was William Dawson that found this, okay? Okay. And um, so this was, this Sternberg guy in 1933 uh, published this photograph at uh, Geological Society uh, of the U.S. And here's what he said. He said, superficially, they resemble tracks of some of the wading birds. Okay. But of course, there's little probability of their having been made by birds. Because the rock's so old. Because the rock's too old. Believe, believe the age of the rock, not the evidence you yes. find. And believe Always. evolution at all costs. At all costs. In spite of the evidence, not because of it. <laughs> In spite yes. of the evidence of birds, we must believe the age yes. of the rock. Yeah. So these, this is some of the stuff in Nova Scotia oh boy. that people can go and look at. Okay. Now, those, those tracks are in storage somewhere, I forget. I tried to track track them down, ah, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, that I just never got responses. But anyway, it's in storage somewhere. If I was a believer in evolution, I would have mm -hmm. them hidden somewhere. 
Well, Far yeah, away. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you can't have birds there. Yes, yeah, but but these work. guys, <laughs> these guys are still there. Okay, there and they are. See, so go during low tide, and they're a pretty good little piece down the beach. Um, but they're and they're out of ways too. But I mean, when you see them, they're they're huge footprints. Yeah, which is an interesting thing. These are bigger than ostrich tracks. But that is commonplace in the fossil record. Almost all organis organisms we find in the fossil record are bigger, bigger. than their modern counterparts. That's right. The, uh, the fossil plants we looked at today yep. at Joggins, uh, they're still alive today. Uh, the horsetail rush. Uh, hey, Roberto, how big was the, that horsetail rush fossil you found? It's like, like that big Yeah, around. it's like this big around, right? Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, today, you know, it's one centimeter around that same plant, yet we find on the fossil record. It's the same uh, with uh, dragonflies. We find dragonflies with literally five foot wingspans. Okay. Um, uh, what are some of the other, uh, and that's another book that Vance did. Okay. Uh, I forget the title right now, but he did another book just on that topic of giantism in the fossil record. So it's just another example of giantism in the fossil record. It yeah. lines up with what we see elsewhere in the fossil record. Incredible. So anyway, that's we're running a lot out of, of evidence. Yeah, we're, that's we're a lot of evidence. We're running out of time, so I'll, I'll skip over the plain nation. We'll skip over the plain nation. Even though that's in Nova Scotia and you can go see it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's have a look here and see if there are questions from y'all. Um, Danielle, I don't know if you got any from YouTube. Well, we got an interesting verse here, Ian. Mm. Jesus said that anyone who doesn't believe in, G in Genesis won't believe in him. That's kind of what you were saying. This is Luke 16, 31. Yep, yep. that's, uh, that's uh, what do you Paraphrased. Call it? Paraphrased, yep. but yes, yes. Oh, and they, Rick would like to know, <laughs> is that an Archaeopteryx fossil behind you full size? And how many have you found? Excellent Tell question. Tell us about this fossil, okay. yeah. So it is not Archaeopteryx. Good, good guess though, because yes. it, it does, uh, I, and I know why he's asking that, because it is, this is a Coelophysis, it's from Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. I didn't find it. This is actually a pretty famous fossil. Um, one of the reasons it's so famous is because finding dinosaurs this intact is incredibly rare. Usually what you find is the entire skeleton has been ripped apart and strewn all over the place. Uh, big Owl as well, that, from which this was reconstructed. So basically, Big Owl is an allosaurus, and um, they found uh, mo a, much of, a bunch of his skeleton, but uh, what the, the artists did, they took the bones and they did the uh, forensic thing, and the artist took the bones, laid clay on them, and tried to build up what what Big Al would would look like. Okay. Uh, using the same forensic technique, right. you know, from when they you know, find a, yeah they find a skull of an unidentified person, and yeah. so they use that technique, which is how they came up with That's Big Al. How they made Big Al. That's how they made Big Al. Look yeah. at that. Uh, but Big Al, his skeleton was found in the same pose this one is found. We, it's so common to have the head and the neck arched back as far as it can go. It's called the opisthotonic pose. It's so common it actually has a technical name. And basically, that is evidence of death by drowning. Um, it was pulling its head back while it was still alive. Trying to breathe. Trying to breathe. And you'll notice also, it's a little off camera here, but the tail as well arches all the way back as well. Can you see that in camera too? Oh, almost. Oh, yeah, you almost. can see it a little bit there. Yeah. Okay, so the tail arches back as well. Uh, all for the same thing. It's under stress. Uh, it is being asphyxiated to death. And what you can't see on camera is even though it's the size of a dog, it is no longer the thickness of a dog. Right. Uh, it's now about the thickness of a uh, McDonald's double Big Mac, I would say. Okay. <laughs> uh, Interesting. So, um, and again, this is common in the fossil record. Big Al's head, if you look at it from the front, yeah. uh, you'll notice it's very narrow. Very narrow. I noticed and, that. And that's because it's also been squished. 
Okay. Um, so this is um, quite common in the fossil record. I don't have any other fossils here to show, uh, but like Green River Formation, the the fossil fish, for example. Did you um, have the dinosaur or the turtle? You, you know what? Sure. The turtle. the turtle is an excellent example. I can. Reach That's from the, the Green River Formation. I can reach the turtle. So <laughs> hand it over here because you have the close-up okay, camera. Okay. Okay. So this turtle, th this is a cast, and you can even see the scutes. Uh, from the bottom shell, it has been squished so badly, so dramatically, that even the bottom shell uh, basically squished outwards. Okay. Um, and so this is very common in the fossil record. So they were uh, buried alive, killed by a fl by floodborne muds and sediments, yep. and then the resulting pressure on top, which was in some cases, miles of dirt and mud piled on top. Wow. The weight of all that, the pressure crushed all these fossils, sometimes paper thin. Yeah. Um, the fossil fish for which the Green River Formation is most famous, uh, they're usually, uh, I would say two, maybe three millimeters wow. thick. Um, and in the Big Valley Creation Science Museum in Big Valley, Alberta, Harry, the owner there has this huge slab of Green River fossil fish, just a beautiful fossil. It's got dozens and dozens of these fossil fish. Even the eyes are preserved in that fossil. Incredible. Uh, you can, you know, all the scales are preserved, the skin, the flesh, the eyes, just stunningly preserved. And there's dozens of those fish in that slab and you can go and see it for yourself at the Big Valley Creation Science Museum. So, Incredible. Anyway, good question. It is not Archaeopteryx. I don't have Archaeopteryx up here or else I would show it. Uh, but Archaeopteryx is a very famous fossil, which also has its head pulled back, arched back. Like a range of fish. Yes, that one came from Germany. And that critter is still alive today. Do you recognize that fish? Yeah, it kind of looks like a musky. Close. Or a jackfish. Pike. Jackfish. Pike. Oh, yeah. Pike. Yeah. yeah. What kind of pike? Oh, northern pike. Close. Look at the beak. Look at the beak. It's got a long, narrow, pointy beak. Oh, boy. It's a gar pike. Oh, I never caught any of those, so I wouldn't <laughs> be able to say. But he's, uh, he's also flat. Mm -hmm. Very flat. <laughs> but yeah, that fossil is alleged to be 55 million years old. 55 million. So 55 million years. It. It's still alive today. Unchanged. You, we can catch them in Ontario. Right. Uh, you can catch them out here, depending on where you're going, if you're fishing for them. Yeah. Catch them a lot in Texas. Okay. Unchanged. 55 million years of evolution has caused the carpike to evolve into the carpike. The carpike. So Insane. You, you compare that to, you compare evolution, which evolution theory is that organisms change over time. Yes. They have to That adapt. is not what we see. What we see in the fossil record is stasis. They stay the same or extinction, neither of which helps evolution. Extinction is a loss of genetic diversity, right. a loss of variation. So it's the opposite of evolution. That's right. Stasis is the opposite of evolution. Yet you read in Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, uh, 11 times it says God created organisms to reproduce after, after their kind. Own kind. Yeah. So according to the scriptures, organisms will faithfully reproduce after their kind. There won't be any major changes. There will be variations. Um, dog, a bulldog and a Great Dane are both dogs. Yep. That's a lot of variation. Yep. They're still dogs. Still dogs. A uh, fox is still a dog. A wolf is still a dog. Yes, even chihuahuas, though some would argue they're not. Uh, <laughs> Sorry if you own a chihuahua. Yes. <laughs> um, so the garpike, the 55 yes. million year old garpike, still faithfully faithfully reproducing its after its kind. After its own kind. To this day. I like it that the Bible is so right. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating that so much evidence, like the bird's feet, yes. is just ignored. Yes. There's a passion there. There's a passion there to make sure that there is not a God. Because if there is a God, mm -hmm. then we are going to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Okay, here we go. We're still going, Ian. So thank you, Rick, for that. Mm -hmm. we, that that okay. got two more fossils out here, Rick. 
Good job. <laughs> Good job. Um, oh, okay. Barb writes in, I believe in creation, but does this mean Adam and Eve were cavemen? Excellent question. Oh, oh. I don't. Uh, it's buried in the box over there. But that's okay. Um, define caveman. <laughs> it's that a, box? It's, uh, yes, but I uh, don't bother. Okay. It'd be, it'd be it'd too hard time. to pull out because I think <laughs> I put a bunch of stuff on it. Um, okay, so define caveman there. Mm. I would say yes and no. Um, okay. Caves probably didn't exist before the flood. Interesting. Um, so, and, and they, people living in caves is more or less a result of the flood because personally, I think I'm open to argument on this one. Okay. Um, but I think the extreme seasons and extreme weather patterns were triggered by the flood. Okay. So before that, it would have just been, I mean, Adam and Eve were, were naked. Yep. They, were, they weren't wearing clothes. And when they did wear clothes, they weren't wearing it to keep warm or to keep their body temperature regulated. They were wearing them to cover their nakedness. That was it. Yeah. Um, so uh, when you refer to cavemen, for example, and I, I'm pretty sure I, I know where she's going with this, uh, so I'm, I'm, I hope I got this right, Barbara. So basically when she's referring to caveman, uh, she's referring to, you know, uh, our idea of like the Neanderthals. They're Guy dumb the brutes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bonk the woman over the head, drag her into the cave, you know. Yeah. Uh, not very intelligent. Now here's the catch, as we talked about last night with the youth. Um, the Neanderthals uh, have had, there has been uh, spear points, and spears and arrows found with the spearheads glued on. Glued on. With a glue that some scientists said was superior to our modern super glues. So living in a cave doesn't make doesn't mean you're stupid. Okay. Uh, King David lived spent an awful lot of time sure in caves. Uh, for example, it had nothing to do with intelligence. It had to do with hey, it Necessity. works. Necessity, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're, uh, um, you, uh, what's the word? You are not desocialized. But yeah. at any rate, there's a lot of reasons for living in caves. Okay. And it has nothing to do with intelligence. Um, and in fact, I think, uh, I've been trying to find this again, and it really bugs me that I can't find it. Uh, I think it may have been one of the apocrypha. Someone somewhere mentioned how Adam weighed the planets. Hmm. And basically he deduced the weight of the planets. So Adam, uh, this is very interesting to me because Adam was, was a super genius. Adam could no doubt in my mind, uh, Adam could have performed full calculus calculations in his brain. Okay. He wouldn't have computers because he didn't need them. His brain was better than a computer. Okay. His brain was better than our modern day supercomputers. He was super intelligent. He was as well. Um, and so when we look through uh, historically, and I, I bring this up last night, I mean, the pyramids, uh, you know, we look back on this and there's TV shows now based on the idea that the pyramids were built by aliens because right. they had, because they were clearly of superior intelligence. Lots of technology. Than humans, you know, they, and we know how long it took them to build. Uh, we know when they were built. Um, we even have a really, really good idea of how they built them. And it was just really smart people. Um, the, uh, as I, I brought up last night, the, uh, the, what they call the Trilithon stones um, in Lebanon, Belbek, Lebanon. So these were 1,000 ton stones that were cut, quarried, and moved, um, I think it was a kilometer and a half to build the foundation of this temple, which was destroyed afterwards. The Romans came in, so this is all before the time of Rome. The Romans came in and built the temple of Isis. They built, the Romans built the temple on top of it. They used this as their foundation for their temple. Okay. So this is before the time of Rome. Yeah. And somehow these people 
And again, we know how they did it uh, because we actually have documentation of how they did it. It was described. And um, these people cut 1,000 ton rectangular blocks, moved them up to these streets and put them in place and built these, this huge temple. Like, uh, like I was mentioning last night, I, I had the privilege of running freight trains for seven years, loved it. Uh, you know, the locomotives, just the locomotives were typically 220 tons. So, you know, if, if you have two locomotives and uh, say five tank cars at 135, 140 tons a piece, now you're getting up to the matching the weight of one of these stones. Yeah. You know, uh, the, so we look at this now and clearly these were intelligent people. We've got in the whole planet with our most advanced technology, we have one crane on the whole planet that can lift those blocks, but it, take, it takes up acres of space to do this. And these people were moving the blocks up city streets, up city streets. and putting them in. Which the crane could not do. Yes. <laughs> so all that to say, Barb. Yes. They may have lived in caves, but they were super smart. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Oh. Ancient technology is a fun topic, actually. Yeah, I bet it is. I've heard a lot of fascinating things done with sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really cool considering, you know, Jericho. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, Manolito Rivers says Green River Formation has horse fossils and herring fossils mm. together, which shouldn't be according to, um, you know, evolution. And palm fronds. If you go to the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, Harry has a gorgeous, it's literally like this big across. Yeah. Green River Formation fossil slab with this huge, perfectly preserved palm frond. And here's the herring fish in the same slab, uh, all prepped out and everything. And, Wild. Uh, yep. Uh, alligators, turtles, like we saw a moment ago. Yep. That's from... Okay, we're back. Sorry about that, folks. We do have one more question with Bill Taylor. Um, did the genetics evolve or flight capability in birds initially hollow bones feathers etc can you say that again please he wrote did the genetics evolve or flight capability in birds initially maybe four right right he put hollow bones feathers etc okay genetics for birds did they evolve okay i would say no i would say flat out that would be impossible okay um, because it's, it's more than just that. Cause like for, for instance, hollow bones, he's, he's correct on that. Uh, but that is more for cooling rather than weight. Okay. And the way that works, uh, birds actually have a very sophisticated, um, uh, cardiovascular system. Uh, their lungs, for instance, are not like ours. Our lungs are bellows. Okay. So we... Inhale and exhale. Yeah. Birds, air comes in one end of the lung, goes out the other. And so uh, there's several things going on there. First of all, the oxygen and the blood are running in opposite directions. And uh, we engineers call that, uh, uh, well, I forget what we call it, <laughs> but it's a common engineering tactic. Uh, we used it at uh, Delta T-Max when I was working on the cool suits. Uh, for the instance. astronauts. Yes, they, they used our cool suits on the space shuttles. Um, NASCAR racers used them all that. I was developing a, uh, a hot suit for cold water divers. Okay. Um, but basically in heat exchangers, it's the exact same principle. Right. Uh, you have the, uh, the flows in opposite directions. And the reason for that is heat or oxygen transfer, you get maximum oxygen transfer in the bird from the air to the blood because the most oxygen rich oxygen is here, but the, ox the blood which has picked up oxygen along the way now has a higher differential of oxygen in the air, still higher than the oxygen in the blood. Whereas over here, 
it's it sucked a whole pile of oxygen out of the air. So this air at this end of the, the lungs has less oxygen, but the blood has less, less oxygen as well. So okay. it gets maximum transfer. If you go oh, in the okay. same direction, yeah. it's way less, way less efficient. Yeah. Once the air leaves the bird's lungs, it then travels through the bones and acts as cooling. So it's a cooling system as well. Okay. Um, so the, I, I, I'm not quite sure where Bill was coming from with, for that because to evolve all of this in unison, the, the genetic changes involved, uh, what did it evolve from, yeah. right? Um, there are many uh, who believe that the, the birds evolved from dinosaurs. Now, yeah. dinosaurs, interestingly, many of them have ho hollow bones. Okay. Uh, I've, I've found some in Alberta uh, where the, you know, the bone was clearly hollow. It was infilled with the same sediments as the surrounding uh, area. Um, and that's actually been a really big question because a lot of dinosaurs, their lung capacity is too small for the body size. Oh. But that's on the assumption <clears throat> that they had bellows lungs like us. Okay. If they have a lung, a cardiovascular system similar to the birds, it's more efficient. Right. So they can, they can source the oxygen for their very large bodies um, with a cardiovascular system that's similar to birds. Yep. Does that mean dinosaurs and birds evolved from one another? N no, it just means it's, it can easily just be as uh, be argued as a common designer. Right. Uh, it works for the birds. Why not use it in the dinosaurs? Yep. You know, instead of just giving them huge lungs, we'll just put a more efficient system in. Yeah. You know, they don't need bellows lungs, so uh, uh, you could you can argue that one either way. Either way. Uh, the the other thing is the genetic changes that would be required to say evolve a dinosaur into a bird uh as little as one change in the genome can be fatal right so you take one base pair in the genome and you remove it or swap it out as little as one change can be fatal now usually you can tolerate thousands yeah. um but uh or sorry tens of thousands um, actually, I'm not even sure it would be tens of thousands. No, it would be thousands at most because that's actually a problem. Okay. Uh, because typically we are gaining about 100 mutations per generation in humans. Okay. And it's collecting because over time, because uh, your grandparents uh, introduced about 100 genetic errors into your parents who introduced another 100 errors into their genetic code, which gave it to you. So you've now accumulated 300 genetic errors. Okay. And so it accumulates over time. This limits the time span on humans. It does. Because the more you're removing, the more you're deteriorating the genetic code. And uh, Dr. John Sanford, who is a geneticist, he was the co-inventor of the gene gun, actually. Okay. And he wrote a book called Genetic Entropy. The mystery of the genome and he documents it all, just just did a beautiful job basically showing how this is accumulating and even if you give evolution the benefit of the doubt and give it a hundred uh, give it one beneficial mutation per generation the detrimental mutations vastly outnumber the beneficial everybody one. agrees on that <clears throat> Um, that's if you're giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying, yeah, it's a beneficial mutation. Right. Their beneficial mutations usually aren't very beneficial. Okay. Uh, but it's being outpaced by the detrimental mutations by, by a long shot um, to the point where it's not just a question of we could not have been around for 100,000 years because we would have accumulated so many errors that we would be dead we would be extinct. Already? Already. Okay. So Too we cannot, errors. genetically speaking, we cannot be 100,000 years old. Wow. So now the question, it's, it's such a high rate that it's actually, uh, in fact, one of the articles, uh, Kond Kondrashov, a Russian guy, Russian geneticist, he subtitled his paper, Why Aren't We Dead 1,000 Times Over? Right. And he was talking about the genetic mutation load. 
Um, so, I mean, that says it all right there. Yeah. Because he believes in deep time. He believes we've been around for 100,000 years, uh, evolving. So his question was very valid. Why aren't we dead a thousand times over? Um, evolving into lesser and lesser versions of ourselves. Yes. Sicker and sicker. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So couldn't we use that to count backwards and figure uh, out just how long we've been here? Which is kind of what Sanford did. Okay. Um, again, that comes back to, you know, this point of question about the flood. Okay. Because before the flood, people lived to almost a thousand years old. Right. Something happened at the time of the flood. Yes. We see giant animals and plants. Uh, presumably, people were bigger as well. They certainly lived longer, according to the biblical records. Um, something changed at the time of the flood, environmentally. Now, the plants that we're seeing at Joggins are, well, the lycopods are like, a meter in diameter, and today they're literally a centimeter, yeah. maybe two in diameter. Uh, so what is that? That's a hundredfold size difference. Um, insects have gotten smaller. Everything's smaller from compared to the fossil record. Something radical happened at the time of the flood. Something changed dramatically, and we are deteriorating. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I asked you about counting backwards. Oh yes. Yeah. So to figure out how long humans have been here. Yeah, so the question the question from a creationist perspective. Yeah. Would be uh, you, you from an evolutionary deep time perspective, you can't count backwards that far. Can't get that. You just far. can't. Um, from a creationist perspective, okay, are we counting back 4500 years to what we believe is the time of the flood or are we counting back 6000 years? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say because so much changed after the flood. Something radical happened. Gotcha. So, okay. Um, Bill likes your answer. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, for that question. Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, okay, we'll take one more because we're going on ninety minutes here. Julie Mick says, "How do those creatures preserved in amber fit into the fossil record?" Are they easier to analyze? So we're doing a throwback okay. Jurassic Park okay. here. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting question, actually. Uh, th thanks for bringing that up, Drew. That's a good question. So amber is a bit of a mystery. So for those who are not familiar, amber is basically fossilized pine sap. Okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, if here in Canada, we got a lot of pine trees, and, you know, you can see the sap dripping off them, you know. And um, so if it collects... Uh, an insect gets stuck in it, it can encase the insect. And in the case of amber, it then gets buried, compressed and preserved as a, in, in sort of fossil form. It's almost like plastic. Uh, I've got a lot of amber in my collection actually. Um, which actually, uh, uh, sidetrack again, <laughs> um, because we were just talking about the, the dramatic environmental changes and carbon-14 dating. Yes. Gary Landis back in, I think it was the late 80s. He was from the US Geological Survey. He did something very smart. He took amber samples from the dinosaur age. So amber samples that are dated to the Cretaceous, the time, uh, what evolutionists are time, dating the time of the dinosaurs. We would say it was from before the flood, okay? He took these amber, amber samples and they had air bubbles in them. So he crushed them in a vacuum chamber okay. and extracted the air out of the bubbles, which presumably is a sample of the atmosphere from the time of the dinosaurs. Time of the amber. And, yeah. And so um, there was a number of remarkable things. It was increased atmospheric pressure, which may or may not be atmospheric pressure increased because remember, this amber has been compressed. Right. <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> all our other fossils okay it's been compressed as well so that may or may not hold true but let's go with it for a second it it showed a dramatic uh pressure differential a greatly increased atmospheric pressure content it showed a higher carbon dioxide uh content okay so if uh, in fact ten a tenfold increase ten so That's um a lot of carbon it is, and it's also interesting from a physiological perspective from, for humans, because uh, I, 
I haven't had a problem with asthma in many years, but when I did, there was a lot of study by a Russian doctor actually, who found that um, uh, he could uh, resolve asthma attacks by simply introducing carbon di more carbon dioxide into the person's air. Well, sir. So he was teaching children to play a game and hold their breath when they were having an asthma attack. And this completely, what this does, the increased carbon dioxide levels cause the, uh, the tubes in your lungs to open up and expand. Okay. The opposite of an asthma attack. Yeah. And um, so, it, so it's interesting. It's almost like we humans were designed to operate in an atmosphere with a higher carbon dioxide level. That's, that one could interpret it that way. Of course, okay? yeah. So the other thing with carbon-14 dating, if that holds true and carbon dioxide levels were 10 times higher in the past, then that affects our carbon-12 to carbon-14 ratio. You have way less carbon-14 now that compared to carbon-12, so the plants are going to absorb way less carbon-14 because they've got more carbon-12. Okay. So they're going to look older because they have a much less, a much smaller amount of carbon-14 in them. Okay. okay. So uh, that, uh, he also, Landis also found that it was increased oxygen uh, in the air bubbles. So this is all really interesting. Um, so that was, that was the sidetrack. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Julie's back, waiting. <laughs> yes. So now coming back to the amber, amber is actually a bit of a mystery. And um, no, I better not talk about that. Uh, Vance just shared some top secret information about oh, amber with edge. me not long ago. Yeah, it's, it's leading, it's pretty dramatic research. Um, Stay tuned. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hopefully, hopefully we can get him to talk about it. Uh, but anyway, amber is a real mystery because there is a lot of it in the fossil record. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. And nobody really, I mean, how do you explain that? Now. It's a lot of pine trees. It's a lot of pine trees and an awful lot of sap. Okay. Why? Now in the context of a global flood, it becomes really interesting because you have a flood wiping out entire forests. Yes. Ripping them up, smashing trees, getting yep. pine sap all over the place. You have floating log mats on the ocean. Right. You have insects and animals climbing onto these floating mats, trying to escape the flood, yep. uh, getting caught in amber. Uh, and that amber either uh, sinks to the bottom of the ocean uh, during the flood or sinks with the floating log mat um, uh, with the insects in it and everything. So within the context of a global flood, you have an explanation for uh, uh, a lot of a lot of what, lot of what we find right yeah what because it's a bit of a mystery why do we find so much amber why do we find them with preserved insects animals feathers i mean it's a, it's a lot of amber okay uh and exquisitely detailed uh exquisitely preserved insects uh i forget what julie's question was julie's question <laughs> well let's go see these sidetracks yeah hold on how do those creatures preserved in amber fit into the fossil record? Are they easier to analyze? Oh, okay. Okay. So basically they're... That's they're how they fit. Have, yeah. That's how they because, came about. Yeah. Because oftentimes they are found, the amber is found in the rock record. Okay. So uh, now what us creationists, of course, say the rock record was formed during the worldwide during flood, the flood of Noah. So it, it makes sense that you would find it there. Yeah. Um, so anyway... Hopefully that there answers to the question. There or, it is. Or at least gives her an entertaining sidetrack. So. <laughs> I hope you like that, Julie. Yes. So there we have it. We have all kinds of evidence for creation. We have all kinds of holes in evolution. I often encourage the youth group when they're learning evolution in, in school to really, really learn it. Ask all the questions yep. you can. Because the more you learn about it, the more holes you'll see in it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So we've got all that. We've got a lot of people out there that still refuse to believe creation, even though it's written all over our planet and not just our planet, but it's in the stars. That would be a whole nother show. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so much evidence, but it all comes down to are people willing to accept that they have to be morally responsible 
in this life, that there is a someone out there that is going to check on them at the end and see how you did. And that is scary for some people. Mm -hmm. And that person is God. That person is Jesus. And he paid the price so that that doesn't have to be scary. He can take away everything that has gone wrong, all the yuck, all the muck. It doesn't have to be scary. Jesus can do that. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you just simply walk into the arms of a very loving father. Thank you so much for, enjoy for joining Ian and I. I hope you liked it. I hope you got something that you can take away and hold on to, use as a tool to help you. Um, so when the end comes, you're standing on the right side of the line when they're divided left and right. Thanks again. Have a great night. We've got all kinds of ideas for more shows on Oxnaz. Uh, the abortion thing is hot right now, so mm -hmm. maybe coming up soon. But thanks so much for joining us, for Ian and I. Check him out on YouTube, uh, Wazulu. He's amazing. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>